R&R, which will also uh, contain the uh, report on the disagreement between the parties and what each of their positions is. Was, was that not the way the special master with the consent of the parties agreed to proceed? It's not how the way the parties agreed to proceed, and that's why I did the blow up, because what they try and do is conflate two entirely different processes together. Because the first process, and the one that is uh, addressed in the top of the handout, has to do with plans proposed by TUSD. And the appointment order provides that the USP will develop a timeline for objections to plans developed by TUSD. So then in the uh, USP section 1D1, the parties came up with a thing where the district would submit a plan on these various issues set out in the uh, um, USP, and then people could object. And then if there was disagreement, the special master could look at it and then submit an R&R. But this was an entirely different process triggered by, the T, by TUSD submitting a plan, and it was to be exchanges amongst each other. Now, which is entirely different from the R&R &R being filed with the court and then objecting in court and having filings in court. Because what ultimately happened is the court initially threw out any right at all to object to the special master R&R. &R. And that was in the December 2nd order. But, but then that was reconsidered. It was reconsidered and then I guess TUSD ultimately was tossed something of a bone, I would call it, where they gave us a quote, right to object. But in order to, for it to be a right to object, it has to be a meaningful right to object and that's what not occurred did not occur for a number of reasons. Because what the court did there is said, okay, special master, you do an R&R &R and you put together the back and forth between the parties and then you file it. And the initial order of the court said, and there'll be no briefing after that. But that was reconsidered. And that was reconsidered and they allow uh, 10 pages in seven days, right? right? And there's two more really significant restrictions that were put on it. Number one is you cannot raise evidence and arguments not previously submitted to the special master. Well, the problem with that is the special master routinely and on a regular basis submits R&Rs that contain issues and things never before seen. Doesn't the order allow you to request an opportunity to further object? file further objection? Well, it does, but so far any, all of our efforts to obtain any additional briefing by this court have been dealt with the same no thank you. But are you, are you, are you appealing the no thank you or are you appealing, I'm not trying to be glib, I'm truly trying to understand your argument. Are you, are, are you appealing that or are you objecting that the, the um, revision pursuant to the court's reconsideration order is inadequate? It's inadequate because there's, there's a couple other components. I'm not trying to interrupt. No, not at all. I'm just wondering why is it? Because my understanding is that, that is, I read it the way you do, I think, that there was initially um, not a right to, to uh, object after the R&R was filed. Then that was, you ob objected to that. There was a, um, that motion for reconsideration was granted and there is this, as you said, 10 day or 10 page, seven day um, opportunity, also an opportunity to ask for, for further opportunity. Uh, if the if the need arises and your your position I think is that's not adequate so my question is why not well I think it's one illusory but secondly when you combine with another restriction that's imposed and that is it restricts the parties from filing any evidence of the communications between TUSD and the special master and the plaintiffs uh, it, it, it it precludes us from developing any kind of a record and one of the problems and one of the reasons why the uh, unitary status was reversed four, three years ago was because we did not have an adequate record of what went on below and specifically an adequate record of good faith compliance with the USP. And th this is really illustrated, these points, 
by the r and r on the university high school admissions plan because in that r and r which we saw for the very first time when it was filed with the court contained many statements many conclusions never heard before we'd never submitted materials on and then when we object to it it gets stricken but a couple of the things the special masters that was the one stricken for exceeding the page limits is that the one yes okay all right but a couple of the things but some of the things we put in that would not have been would have been stricken because they contained information of communications between USP and the special master because one thing the special master said pointing to the USP was that the USP required that in developing the U university high plan that TUSD work with the plaintiffs and the special master to help develop it the special master in its R&R &R, made a conclusory statement that that did not happen in the objection filed by TUSD it was pointed out by affidavit and otherwise that they were in virtual daily contact with the special master for 11 months sometimes as many as 20 emails a day on this topic so why can't you file record of that why can't you ask permission to file record of that a declaration to that effect what am I missing procedurally the court said we can't the court said I do not want to see that I don't want to see communications between the parties but that is how we establish record of compliance that we need to obtain unitary status so you would have to file permission to file that it's not it's not in the in the pursuant to the motion for reconsideration it would not be permitted as a matter of course it's not permitted as a matter of course under the court's rule and and this rolls into the other two problems with it is timing now the under the uh, appointment order we had 30 days to file an objection rule 53 gives 21 days and they raised that from 10 and the committee notes to that movement from 10 to 21 days was a recognition that special masters are typically appointed in cases involving complex issues where there would need to be uh, complicated and detailed responses and that additional days would be needed and this case is pretty complex Universe. Those, those cases ordinarily haven't gone on for 40 years in order to try to obtain constitutional compliance. This is not really an ordinary uh, business litigation matter. Uh, it, it does seem that uh, there would be a reason to try to work together and have expedited proceedings so that we could arrive at constitutional compliance uh, in a case that started in 1978. Well, it actually started in 74. The order was in 78. Okay. It, it, I was in high school when it started, Your Honor, to <laughs> give you some idea. But no, you're absolutely right. And that's what we're trying to endeavor to do. And, but the, and that's why we should have you know, some additional time. Can we truncate the time? Maybe. But that's why another thing that didn't occur is both the appointment order and Rule 53 requires the court to give notice and opportunity to be heard if they're going to if he's going to change the appointment order and maybe we could have sat down and negotiated something to tighten up that those days but we wouldn't have ended up with 10 days i mean again the university high plan is a good example because after we saw the r and r for the first time TUSD scrambled around obtaining and submitting source materials, research, affidavits, summaries of interviews of experts, because we didn't have time for affidavits. They assembled over 400 pages of documents in support of it. And to do that in, under, with a 10-day 10, 10 deadline is problematic, which leads us also to the, uh, the seven-day deadline. But that leads us to the 10-page limit. That's problematic because there's no restriction on how much the special master can file, and we have to deal with all of the USP requirements in the objection. And with regard to the university high, there's like 10 or 12 of them, which is an even harder task when the special master himself did not go through any of those. So we have to go with otherwise unrebutted statements like the one about cooperation and, and have to address that. But is there really any reason to go from 17 pages to 10? especially in a situation where by doing away with all that briefing they actually did away with a response a reply, uh, uh, an objection response and reply and to take all that briefing and reduce it to 
to 10 pages, I mean, it really was just a bone to give us a small uh, bit of due process. Uh, I'd like to save some of the uh, remaining time, but uh, the bottom line is, TUSD is entitled to have an Article III judge that's engaged as the ultimate arbiter of USP compliance. It is extremely important. The case has been going on for so long, and TUSD, I can assure you, is working diligently and in good faith to achieve that status. And we're entitled to have some procedural and substantive safeguards per the negotiated agreements, Rule 53, a complete and accurate record so that if we're here five or six years from now, we're not going to hear somebody saying, well, it's not in the record. Otherwise, we fear unitary status will remain forever out of our grasp, and we absolutely don't want that. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. Lois Thompson on behalf of the Mendoza Plaintiff Appellees. One thing that you did not hear from counsel for TUSD was any discussion of the fact that this court does not have jurisdiction to hear the appeal. The appointment order, the unitary status plan are not the documents that are before this court. What are before this court are four orders that do not modify an injunction. There is no basis for hearing this appeal in this court. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that point because counsel did not spend time on it and reached to the merits, but I think it's very important to stress that the orders before this court simply do not modify an injunction, and they certainly don't meet the other aspects of the test set by the Supreme Court in Carson, which do apply to acts and orders modifying injunctions as this court has recognized in the United States against El Dorado, notwithstanding the statement to the contrary in TUSD's reply brief. Counsel's uh, brief uh, argues in the alternative that even if it doesn't satisfy the Carson test, that mandamus relief is warranted. And what he's really arguing, I think, is that it's so important that an adequate record be prepared that, that our court ought to take a look at whether that's happening because it's so important to get to a unitary status plan to achieve uh, uh, um, the end to judicial oversight. So what is your response to that? Our response is it also does not rise to the extraordinary and drastic remedy mm -hmm. of mandamus. Is the record that's being compiled adequate? Yes. And did, in didn't fact... The, the, didn't the government move for some action because it did not believe it was adequate? The government moved for the appointment of a magistrate judge to supervise the proceedings, making the point that there were hundreds of emails going back and forth and that some additional control should be exercised. It was in response to that that the district court judge entered his order of December 2nd. And one of the really mind-boggling things that has us here today is that in the very order in which the district court judge painstakingly set out what should be provided so that he could rule on a report and recommendation, the school district now claims was somehow a loss of its rights. And I think that what's important here is actually to look at the district court, rather the school district's exhibit, but from a slightly different perspective, and 